Hello and welcome to FML Fund My Life, a podcast brought to you by My Wall Street. My name is Nicole and I'm the social media manager at My Wall Street. And with me today, as usual and always, is Anne Marie, who is our, one of our top investment analysts. Hi, Anne Marie. How are you? I'm good, Nicole. How are you? I'm good. Very excited as I'm going on holiday tomorrow. Yeah. I'm going to Budapest, going to a music festival called Ziga. So definitely in the holiday mode already. But, um, uh, what yeah. what act are you most excited to see? Most excited for Rufus de Sol, which is um, an American, uh, no, sorry, Australian band. And then even like, like Ju- I'm excited to see Dua Lipa, Justin Bieber, yeah. like all the kind of pop ones. That'll be good. And then there's some really good DJs going like Ben Clark, Dennis Sulta. But yeah, excited. But nice. seven I- nights. So I'm camping for eight nights. <sighs> That's a bit much now. I know and I'm t- like I just feel like this is the last time I'll ever do anything like this because like I'm 27 so this is <laughs> like it, me and my best Black friend are like right we'll do it and then we'll never do it again. Yeah. Jesus and you'll be back you are you go- you're going for a week and then coming back sh- straight to work yeah you don't have any days off. No I actually I have one day off because my I'm getting in like really late on a Tuesday night I'm off Wednesday and then in work on Friday Thursday and then we're off on Friday. Wow yeah. well we'll see how you're doing on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like as long as you have one day to recover we're yeah. fine all right but um, Fair enough. how was your week pretty good week so far we're in earnings season so as you know I'm very very busy watching stuff roll in but I mean a bit of a silver lining this week we are starting to see some tech companies have positive earnings so that's always nice I think the market mm-hmm. we might have bottomed out in the market um, I saw Roy to say see, that today, actually. In Slack. Yeah, we're starting to see some stocks creep back up. Some of the mm-hmm. like big names that we like, some of the growth companies that we're interested in. Um, mm-hmm. I think some of the pessimism has kind of run its course, and and it seems investors and analysts are a bit more interested again in growth names. So it's yeah. good news for us. Always, it's always much easier to introduce people to the product and introduce them to investing when something is going green. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's kind of um, what we've been saying as well. Like, don't listen to the news too much, you know, because yeah. it's actually like, hopefully all of us got some discounted shares the last few months yeah. and we didn't sell everything. Um, yeah. Here's hoping. That actually brings us in nicely to let you all know what this episode is about. So it's kind of probably probably our most useful episode that we've ever done. Like, we're going to yeah. go from scratch and tell you how to build a portfolio. And Anne-Marie, you've made a really cool pyramid that we're going to go through later. Mm-hmm. So this is really one to get your pens and paper out to like start making your own pyramid and yeah listen along because we're going to go through how to pick your first stock right up until picking riskier ones that have high reward yeah um that means we're going to talk about some stuff like diversification full and half positions dollar cost averaging and kind of make this transition easy for you as you begin to wade into the market hopefully not jumping headfirst in like pretty much everyone uh, on this podcast has done and it actually turns out that an awful lot of people at my wall street did that um we i went ahead and surveyed uh, mike from the analyst team and podrick from the content mm-hmm. team to talk to them about what their first stock picks looked like and how they started investing and if they were conceiving an entire portfolio when they made that first step and um turns out no most people just buy one stock and they're like yeah we'll figure it out later Mm -hmm. so the first story is from mike who is an investment analyst as you might have heard him on stock club as well and he said that his the first stock he picked was Square Now Block, and he used the money that he got from my Wall Street. So when we start working here, we're given $100 to get us started, to get us familiar with investing. And he used that to invest in this company. And th- he said the thinking behind it was that he saw the like the little iPod and um, paying stations in like loads of cafes and restaurants that he was going to. And he was like, yeah, this is going to be, be my first stock. And it just got him thinking about, you know, getting started more. And he really just wants to jump in. And that was his first play. What was Podrick's? Uh, Podrick's first stock was Nike. Um, And it was interesting speaking to him because he said that he sort of narrowed it down to Nike or Apple. Um, He wanted something that he believed in, something that he was using every single day. Um, And then it's also impressive to see he kind of gravitated towards much larger companies, which I think would also be our preference. Mm. We've spoken about that when we talk about our first stock regrets. We're like, oh, we probably should have started with larger companies. Um, Mm. 
and yeah, he kind of said that he didn't do much due diligence in terms of, of the financials, which I suppose is fair enough because he's using the My Wall Street product. And um, I guess yeah. like we are meant to be providing the due, the due diligence. And I think we do a good job of that, like keeping you up to date and everything the companies are doing and how their earnings are looking. Um, and that was just enough of the, the confidence that it gave him. He also said that he'd read the book Shoe Dog, which is um, – quite a famous book about the origin of Nike. Um, and he'd really enjoyed that. And he kind of felt if that spirit and that management team was still in place, that the company was probably going to have longevity for a really long time. And I mean, I would agree with him in the sense that Nike probably has such a strong brand at this point. It's it's not going mm. anywhere. I think it is. Definitely. Yeah, it's the number one name in sportswear. It's 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 not going anywhere quickly. So yeah. um, it was nice to see someone gravitating towards a bigger company. But I also like agree with Mike being like, Jesus, I see square devices everywhere mm. they're obviously doing something right because i think that was kind of similar thinking i had when i picked slack where i was like wow it seems more and more companies are using this software i'm using it now it mm. has good reviews you know what like this company is obviously doing something right so um yeah. Yeah, was, the, the only thing about square is that they do have a lot of competition now oh yeah a lot of competition yeah yeah, mm. yeah that's but, that's definitely changed their kind of risk profile in the last two years two years yeah but competition is such a weird thing because nike has loads of competition as well but it's yeah. just the market leader now. So, you know, it, it is kind of a tricky thing to figure out. Like, just mm. because the company has competition doesn't mean it's not a good investment, but then it yeah. really can like affect other companies. It's weird. Yeah, I suppose, like, Nike's probably biggest competitive risk, which is something we're seeing more and more, is... I think Nike's always trying to be like, we're the number one sportswear brand and they're trying to cover every single sport. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not effective. Like sometimes you do need a retailer who is specialized in a single sport. And mm -hmm. so that is, I think, where Nike loses market share. And a good example of that is I grew up competitively swimming. And for two years um, of my high school team, we were sponsored by Nike, which meant that all of our gear came from them and our yeah. suits came from them. And Nike is not known for manufacturing swimsuits. And they really weren't great swimsuits. We were really frustrated mm. by them. We didn't really like them. But they were deeply discounted to us. So we were like, well, these are the ones we're going to go with. Mm. Whereas on traditional club teams I would swim on, we would be swimming with um, Speedo or um, TYR, which is yeah. they're both like big name um, swimsuit mm -hmm. manufacturers. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's where Nike's vulnerability lies. And that's where companies can find opportunities. If they're like, yeah. oh, for rowing, you need this type of equipment. Yeah. And Nike isn't that good at manufacturing it because they obviously are not investing that much in it. I think that's where where they can be vulnerable. Yeah. And you've seen, like, we've seen that with, like, Lululemon. They kind of focus on yoga. Yeah. They've done really well. Gymshark is big in the UK. I'm not sure mm -hmm. is it big in the US either. But, like, they focus on gym wear. Right on so, like, sport, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, yeah. they've done really well there as well. Yeah. Well, with those stories in mind, I suppose we need to kind of bring to our audience, right? We've we've all shared all of these first stock stories and said, mm -hmm. well, we all jumped into the market incorrectly. So I suppose they're probably sitting around wondering, <laughs> well, how am I supposed to be getting into the market correctly then? And <laughs> this is something that me and Nicole talk about all the time where we're like, oh, there needs we need a bit of an easier procedure to help people maybe have a look at the short list and start creating their own watch list and trying to figure out how do I diversify? How do I take those first steps responsibly? And so I sat down last week and I was like, I'm going to build a pyramid, a pyramid <laughs> for your portfolio, if you will. And so what the pyramid Sometimes. ended up looking like is a uh, standard shape. And then I put five bands across it. Right. And we've discussed this concept before where you're kind of low risk foundational stocks or, you know, big tech names, index funds. And as we approach the top, we have high risk, high reward companies. You know, these are um, probably companies that that are fun, that are interesting. Maybe they're in doing something that you're really passionate about, but like this might not all pan out. You know, they have a high risk profile. And so as you ascend up the pyramid, you should be probably holding a lower percentage just so you can mm -hmm. shore up yourself to risk, if you will. Yeah. So we're going to walk step by step through the pyramid. We have picked a stock for each category. The caveat to this is in my ideal world, there are five bands on the pyramid. In my ideal world, you would pick three stocks for each band and you would have 15 stocks. Now, you wouldn't like jump right in and put money into all those 15 stocks initially. We're going to talk about that later on. Mm -hmm. But you would kind of gradually build up your portfolio to this position. I think that's 15 is a pretty solid number. It means that you can keep track of them, particularly some of these yeah. bigger companies you can worry a little bit less about. So you don't need as much attention. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's enough, like that should give you enough assurance that you're diversified across enough you know, sectors, geographies, market caps, yeah. and you should... You know, get some exciting returns, but also hopefully not, not lose it all. So yeah. um, shall we get started, Nicole? Yes. But before we name any stocks, we just 
want to say something that I put on most of our social media posts it's hashtag not financial advice (laughs) these are just yeah like our suggestions and stuff but um it is a really good way to break down your portfolio but um, what is the difference between advice and suggestion I don't know I just know that it's so weird like you're allowed to say some things for free but you're not allowed like not give a warning it's like but but like to my wall street users we can say this is a really good stock to buy now but Mm -hmm. because they're paying us but it's like if you're telling everyone something it's really weird it's a really really weird rule but um well i suppose it's worth saying just for everyone who knows all the stocks that we're going to be talking about today and all of the categories that we use to group the stocks Mm. together that's like all stuff that's in the my wall street app um, yep. So this is all like freely accessible to you. If you uh, get a subscription or a free trial, you can go and check that out. And then because they're on our short list, it means that you can be assured that we'll be keeping you updated on those stocks. So if you, yep. you know, end up being interested in some or we say some names you've never heard before and you want to learn more, download the app. So yeah. And don't just take these and run with them because <laughs> yeah. investment thesis can change. And that's the kind of value of, you know, having analysts on your side, like yep. in the My Wall Street app is like, we will keep you updated. And if anything does change, you'll get lots of, um, warning and information and content and how to kind of ride out the storm perfect okay so for all of us for people following along at home please take a piece of paper (laughs) and draw a triangle (laughs) (laughs) all right and you're gonna put your first horizontal band down at the bottom these are your foundational stocks and i called this category if all else fails because i kind of figured i love that thank you i i figured you know these are these these are the ones that will ground you worst comes to worst and there are two categories in this in this band the first one is index funds, which is something me and Nicole talk about all the time. Yeah. So, it's like your bread. You're yeah. making a sandwich. Yeah. It's it's the bread. It might even be the plate. Like, that's how important it is. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, for our index fund choice is very simple. It's the S&P 500 index fund. We talk about it all Love the time. That. Safe option. Solid. Annual returns. Very easy to invest in. You don't have to think about it. It's worth mentioning, though, we talk about index funds all the time. We talk about S&P 500. There are other types of index funds um and there are what are they called etfs we have a couple etfs as well in the um my wall street shortlist that are worth kind of taking a look at Mm -hmm. and they are similar to an index fund except they have themes so we have one um that i think is ticker symbol is hack and they're interested in like cybersecurity. so it's a big grouping of cybersecurity Mm -hmm. companies all together so maybe if you know you wanted to do the s&p 500 index fund and you wanted to pair it up with another really diversified fund but maybe have maybe a bit more risk and reward profile you could have a look at one of those specialized ones but anyway yeah so and they're like the are they like the arc um ones yeah. as well yeah yeah arc is also yeah. um yeah. an etf that you can have a look at um mm-hmm. so sitting next to index funds on the bottom of our pyramid is big stable boring tech to butter yeah there you go wow if if anyone is not irish they won't understand why you would put butter on a sandwich oh really Bread yeah, and butter. even the way I say that, so so butter. <laughs> yeah, like an American person, like it's like mustard or mayonnaise. Okay, well it's your it's your sauce. It's your condiment. Condiment. Here we go. Your sauce. <laughs> um, yeah, butter's not sauce. <laughs> <laughs> what is, is butter? Yeah, butter's not a sauce. What is it called? Like, huh? I don't know. I'm Let us know. Things here. Okay. Let us know, listeners. Big stable boring tech. I just want to give a bit of a caveat here for this label. I think traditionally people would maybe have called these FANG stocks, right? F A A N G. Yeah. Um, and for several years, everyone was always like, this is big tech. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's even like the big four. I know Scott Galloway used to say that, oh, there's the big four tech companies. FANG mm-hmm. stood for Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And for a really long time, everyone was like, these are the indisputable names in big tech. They're not going anywhere. They have consistent returns. I actually think that that profile has significantly changed probably in the last year to two years. Mm-hmm. Um, Facebook has had, a, has had a hard time the last year to two years. Yeah. Their business is under a fundamental shift. They're moving towards the metaverse. They don't have as much money for ads. And Netflix as well, I think, is has a tremendous yeah. increase of competition. Netflix is like always surprised me that it was in that group and like because it's so yeah. much smaller than like Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, yeah. like oh, yeah, Microsoft, Microsoft isn't even in it. Um yeah. because it w- it was F A N G first and then they added another A, didn't they? Yeah. 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 But yeah, like Netflix is very random. They put I it. know the other companies are in like so many different verticals. So you're like, oh yeah, yeah. Apple, Amazon google like oh they're diversified businesses but netflix really Mm -hmm. is just the movies but that's like how when they were the only name in streaming people were like oh this is a sure thing Mm -hmm. anyway so i wouldn't say that 
big stable born tech and fang are synonymous because we've seen mm. the profile of any of these companies change but you are just kind of looking for something that's pretty consistently moving and so we decided to go with apple um yeah. which i think that's a pretty straightforward decision to be honest yeah everyone knows yeah. how many people have iphones <laughs> like they're massive they have like apple podcasts apple music now the apple car is coming out like they're so diversified yeah. And I really love that there it's both hardware and software and software is so good for recurring revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that they're doubling down on. And also they've had this big push in the last couple of years that they want to manufacture their own parts. So they're now making their own chips, the M1 chip mm-hmm. and the M2 chip, which means they're less dependent on other tech companies um, such as mm-hmm. Intel. So yeah, I really just think- And they're going like, into streaming as well. Yeah. yeah so really, yeah, Apple Apple is a very easy decision. And particularly yeah. like if you have an iPhone, you have a MacBook, you're using them every day that's you know buy what you know you definitely know yeah. apple okay so now on to band two so we go up one right and there are two categories in this as well and the first one is dividend payers slash established brands you can also call this category the dow stocks now for those of you that yeah. don't know the dow and the s p 500 um are things you hear about all the time on financial news uh the dow is like very old established american companies they're like pretty consistent they've been around forever so like disney's on the dow coca-cola is on the dow um and these tend to be companies that have like reached maturity and they pay dividends but they still are pretty solid investments but you're not going to see tremendous returns from them but they're a good way to kind of weigh down your portfolio if you will Mm -hmm. so for these for this category we went with home depot okay any thoughts on home depot I actually invest in Home Depot and it's one of nice. the only ones, one of the only stocks in my portfolio that's actually up at the moment because I invested yeah. like two years ago. So if you start investing two years ago, your portfolio is <laughs> down. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I do invest in Home Depot. Um, I think it was when it was picked as one of the stock of the month. Stock of the month. I'm not sure yeah. when. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Like a year years. and a half ago. Yeah. yeah. I, I like Home Depot. They're kind of, um, so there's, they're like a, how do you describe them? So in the United States, they like would have everything you need if you like wanted to like refurbish your house, build something construction, yeah. you know, it's all all that type of stuff. And um, I really like them because number one, they're a dividend payer. And number two, they seem to be successful regardless of macroeconomic conditions, because mm. when the economy is doing well and we're building houses, they're obviously successful. Yeah. because They have like timber and all those supplies. But then when the economy isn't doing too well, people opt to refurbish their homes rather than move to completely new ones and so mm. home depot does well even in that condition yeah so they seem and during to the be pandemic sorry yeah and during the pandemic they did well because people were stuck at home and they wanted to make their house nicer so they're going yep. to the shop and getting all their stuff and doing it themselves yeah so mm. very easy one to pick uh yeah. again if you're american you probably see them all over the place they're very common you've probably been in one mm. um yeah so it was kind of same kind of easy so pick what, for us what part of the sandwich would that be I'm trying to think about this analogy now. Probably like lettuce. Lettuce, okay. Lettuce, okay. And then the second category in band two, which by the way, I didn't introduce. The title of band two is boring with a little bit of spice. Nice. I like that. Thank you. And then the second- hint of risk. Yeah, just a little bit. And the second category in this band is big tech with a bit more risk. So we had big, stable, boring tech. Now, this is same type of thing. You're looking for a larger company, but maybe with a slightly um, more significant risk profile. I would almost put Facebook in this category at this point because mm. now they're saying, oh, our growth is in the metaverse. But like, that's a pretty big gamble. We don't know if that's going to pay yeah. off. Um, yeah. But the company we decided to go with for this category was Viva Systems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on Viva Systems? Not too many. I don't invest in the stock. Yeah, do you? I invest in Viva Systems. I like them. Um, and I remember at the beginning of this year on the other podcast, we were talking about, oh, what's your kind of, if you were starting a portfolio from scratch, what would be your pick? And mm. I picked Viva Systems and Rory was like, it's actually one of my biggest holdings. So that was a good, nice little load of confidence. Viva Systems. Hashtag always... not financial advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, Viva Systems though is... It, it's a it's a funny company because you probably haven't interacted with them. They create software for pharmaceutical companies and life science companies, which basically helps these companies do any of the back end stuff that they need to do: storing data, analyzing data, um, even stuff like making sure that they're in line with regulations um, for like testing and experimentation and stuff like that. Um, and they're pretty much the only company in that space. They dominate the industry. It's something like eighteen or nineteen of the top. 20 largest pharmaceutical companies in the world use them. They're not going anywhere. They have a really great management team who's been there forever. Um, they have like, they're a 
what's it called? They're like a for good corporation. You know, they're like registered that the the company has to be aligned so that its goals are also for the common good of 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 the Earth's population or something like mm-hmm. that. Overall, really good company. They are a boring company, to be honest, because uh, all they do is make software for pharmaceutical companies. But um, but an easy one to love. Yeah. It's the chicken fillet. Oh, OK. Yeah. But also, yeah. Not, no Americans will know this, but that's okay. Well, this is a cultural experience. Okay, so now we're on to band three, just above that. And this category, this band is titled Important Diversification. Okay. Um, and the first category we have in here, now this is a big amalgamation. I pushed a bunch of stuff in here all together. So I did brick and mortar retail, travel and food all clumped mm-hmm. together in one category, right? Okay. And so, so it's like old industries. Yeah, kind of like stuff that you like have to go and see in person, stuff that you like you know like we've you know like booking.com and stuff like that stuff you're in stuff you're Mm. interacting with but that's not you know crazy high growth and brick and mortars in this category so you obviously know who we're gonna pick oh yeah no no trophies for guests and Marie's pick for this one (laughs) no questions asked you obviously have to go to with costco 10 out of 10 i don't even think we need to explain that to (laughs) yeah she just loves costco it's amazing it's great stock Super solid. Treat their staff well. You gotta love it. Okay. Second category in this band is growth abroad. This is something we talk about all the time. You know, you want to be diversified across a bunch of different industries, but it's Mm -hmm. also pretty important to be diversified across a geography. This is even more important as the internet continues um, to penetrate into more and more developing markets, because that means there could be huge growth potential in these places. We're talking about like South America. Mm -hmm. And so the company we decided to go with, this company is actually having a great month this month, uh, which is Mercado Libre. Um, and Mercado Libre, for those who don't know, would be kind of like the Amazon of South America. It's based out of Brazil. They also do like payment systems and they would have um, a service that would be quite similar to Revolut. They do all this type of stuff. Um, and they have been doing really well the past couple of years. They've been doing really well throughout the pandemic when people were stuck at home and needed to order in more stuff. Mm-hmm. Very interesting business. Uh, very large business, to be honest. And yeah, I thought that was a nice little bit of diversification. Yeah, it's it's the first one actually. When you say geography diversification, I think of Mercado Libre. I think we've just yeah. written about that so much. Like, yeah, people yeah. really seem to love it. Mm-hmm. Okay, and now we are on to our fourth band. We're getting towards the top of the pyramid here, and this band is entitled "Stocks That Make You Work for It." <laughs> now, I went with this title for two reasons. Number one is that these have a have a have a higher risk profile, and so you might be a little bit more worried, a little more distressed. But also, they're stocks that make you work for it because sometimes they're operating in industries that you need to do a bit more work in order to understand the company and like do your due diligence to make sure that you know how and why they make money. Um, I think that's a for me at least as an investor, I always like to try and get my knowledge up to a comfort level that I'm like, oh. I understand how this company will be impacted by various Mm -hmm. conditions. Um, So within that, there's kind of two categories, which I kind of lumped together again, which is (laughs) technological disruption and backend players. So these tend to be software companies, tech companies that are operating in spaces that aren't exactly, you know, clear to your eye. They're probably not companies you've interacted with, but maybe you have in like a subtle way, you know, maybe they're providing an infrastructure to a company that you do work with. So I thought Mm -hmm. that was kind of an interesting one. And Mm -hmm. for this category, we have to go with Duolingo. Love them. Yeah. They have a really great pub. They're a really great publicly facing brand. They're really popular yeah. on TikTok. They have like, the best TikTok ever, and it's like yeah. a, like a young woman who's running that. Like she's done yeah. so well. I think they're the best social media strategy I've seen. Yeah, and they're kind of quite a young company, quite a fun company. They're exciting, but also they're a significant technological disruption. I think to the education market. Yeah, like they're showing, particularly when it comes to learning language that there's a better way to do this. You know, that there's a mm-hmm. way to co- like to force people to be consistent with things. Mm. By, Make it fun as well. Yeah, by like heading to them through their smartphone. I think that that's really innovative. Um, they obviously have competition in the language learning area, but I would argue that they don't really have much competition when it comes no. to like doing that on mobile or anything like that. I, um, I actually can't think of anyone like Duolingo. So that's a really good yeah. sign. And like, yeah. especially like I've lived abroad a lot. So I'm, I'm always talking to English speakers who are trying to learn um different languages and they always say oh before i came over to portugal i, I did a few duolingo, duolingo. lessons it's it's yeah. just the only company you hear like yeah and yeah. rory's rory's the same like he um goes over to portugal quite a lot and he's like yeah mm. i've been learning portuguese on duolingo for like two years he's like it's so easy um mm. people really seem to love the product and they're pushing into more educational areas recently they announced that they're heading into math which i think will be very interesting mm. i mean 
education does seem to be one of those sectors that is being a bit left behind by like the technological revolution. If Duolingo is going to kind of be a major player in that, or at least in their niche of languages and something else, I think that that's like worthwhile. And I think it's a, it's, cool. it, it's an easy stock to feel good about, you know? Yeah. I'd call yeah. them like your hot sauce. Yeah. You know, make you work for it. Yeah. It's nice. a little bit of spice. Nice. Okay. Make you work for it by having water. <laughs> Very top of the pyramid. This is our final band. I call this, so this band. This is like something you shouldn't allocate a large portion of your exactly. portfolio to. Yeah. Yeah. This band I called fun companies you're passionate about, but may not pan out. Mm-hmm. Which I think is fair enough. And this, of course, yeah. this category is high risk, high reward. So we have a category called this in the My Wall Street app and we use it when we like are flagging companies that we're like, oh, you know, they're in the middle of a transition. They're in the middle, they're in the middle of doing something really great. If the market blows in their favor, they could blow up, but also at the same time, you know, there's so many balls up in the air, we don't really know what's gonna happen. Mm-hmm. And so we have a few of these on the short list. They're all in like such different areas, which is really interesting. Um, but in this case, we decided to go with lemonade. Okay. Yeah, um, which is a stock that Emmett talks about all the time. It's a stock that yeah. you had to do a lot of research on early days. Yeah. Uh, can you explain to the people what Lemonade does? So they like provide insurance needs, but like they have like technology to get like cheaper quotes and make mm-hmm. the whole process like cheaper for them, so you get a better quote. And they also give a portion of your um, the money you pay for insurance to charities, don't they? Yeah, uh, that was yeah. kind of the way that they found. Um, because apparently like the reason car insurance is really expensive in the United States is because it's a lot mm-hmm. of fraud where people claim against their insurance um, and get away with it. And so Lemonade was like, oh, a way to fix that is to put the people who buy insurance and the insurer on this on the same page for something. So for it's like every month that you don't claim against your insurance, Lemonade will donate a portion of your uh, monthly monthly fee to a charity of your choice. And so this has kind of helped people be like, oh, you know what, like. I'm not going to claim against my insurance if something didn't happen. And so that mm. has reduced Lemonade's cost to users. Well, um, it's made them very popular. That's a bit weird because, right, what, like, if you're an insurance frauder, are you yeah. really also a charity charitable person? <laughs> you know, I guess like, it's can just you? Like, you're, the guilt, like, they're trying to appeal to your heart. But then they don't feel guilt about doing insurance fraud. <laughs> I think it's because people are like, this is a massive corporation and it doesn't really matter, you know? yeah i like that you know yeah i like comp- yeah if, if people like are like thinking for the little guy but they don't want they want to like yeah. d- screw over a big company <laughs> yeah lemonade is also a, a fairly small company to be fair and they mm. just bought um another company that that Emmett used to talk about all the time which is metro mile which is a car insurance mm. that's based upon like how frequently you use your car because there's apparently a whole subsection of, of people who own cars in the United States that never drive them. And so they're like, why am I paying full insurance if I'm only going to drive this 100 miles mm-hmm. a month, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, very interesting. Insurance is something that desperately needs to be disrupted. This is technological disruption for that industry. But again, lots of competition. There's a lot of antiquated players that could maybe get up to speed with them and bring in some sort of technology. They're a really small company. Mm-hmm. They control less than 1% of insurance in the United States. You know, this is a very much a developing story, but a, but a really interesting company. Yeah. But the big question is, what sandwich ingredient are they? God, like the toothpick they put in the sandwich to keep it together, maybe? <laughs> no, but you're not passionate about that. Yeah. I mean, I could maybe pickle. Like Marmite or some. Yeah, Marmite or pickle because some people just yeah. are obsessed with them. It's whatever you're obsessed with that yeah. it might not the, work out. Like it might not you're go like, on. Your unusual sandwich addition is your yeah. high risk reward. Yeah, it could yeah. be Marmite, it could be pickle. Yeah. Let us know what your unusual sandwich edition is via social media. Yeah. And I hope you, you enjoyed um, building a sandwich while we build a pyramid. And I hope it wasn't too confusing because yeah. it's really all I, all I brought to this segment. Uh, here, I have, <laughs> I, I have a few more details, right, about the pyramid. Just so this is my due yeah. diligence. This is me helping people out, right? So in my ideal world i kind of envisioned this as being right so there are five bands on the pyramid so i figured three companies in each band would give you 15 stocks that's a pretty solid portfolio that's manageable that's something you Mm -hmm. can check in with and then basically your the percentage of your portfolio that's composed of each band should descend as you ascend the pyramid so obviously you want more a larger percentage of your portfolio to be in foundational stocks in like your second and third tier heading up towards the top which is high risk high reward um Another thing that I just was thinking about that's worth mentioning, that's worth considering, is making sure you're not overexposed in a single way of generating revenue. And Mm -hmm. what I mean by that is that sometimes companies in different industries 
in different categories and different bands um, or are actually all making money in the same way. And so you just need to check in with that. So an example of this is a lot of consumer facing tech at the minute makes money from advertising, right? So mm. Google, Meta, Pinterest, Roku, and the trade desk all are generating money from ad revenue and mm. ad revenue is struggling at, right now. But you could in theory own four of these five companies because they are in they're across different industries or categories and then you'd be slammed the last two quarters while that while advertising hasn't been doing yeah. too well so mm -hmm. that's just something to keep in mind make sure you're checking that's with your business yeah. and, and and understanding how they make money to make sure you're you're diversified in that way as well yeah that's a really good point because we see that in like marketing as well like traditional advertising has been changed so much like a lot oh, of yeah. people, a lot of uh, brands are putting more money into even on the ground PR, but also like content creators and influencers, like that's kind mm -hmm. of the next big um kind of advertising stream. And those companies, yeah, don't really like, like nearly like they don't really have like an influencing strategy, uh, PR and all those kind of things. So we're yeah. kind of moving back in marketing a little bit. Yeah, kind of going more digital, towards yeah. creativity. We're Which losing it, the targeted it's ads. Great. It's great. It's because we're all super, we're hyper aware of digital ads now. Yeah. you know what I mean we know like we but people actually want to buy from people they know love or either people that are like really honestly back in a company like yeah that's interesting but that's a really also, good point yeah but generating revenue yeah it's also like a, with the loss of targeted advertising because of decisions that Apple has made I think it's fully which changed the advertising game completely mm. yeah and yeah. I think Another way you could have fallen into that kind of trap would have been if you invested during the pandemic in like all these stocks that are doing well right now. Yeah. So like Peloton, yeah, Zoom, yeah, yeah. you're like, oh, we're all going to be from home, working from home forever. And mm -hmm. as you notice, a lot of people have gone back to the office. Like it has yeah. changed the work environment forever. But if you did just, you know, put a lot of your money into stay at home stocks, you, mm -hmm. you, you, you could be in trouble as well. Yeah. Yeah. That is a good point. So now we have our pyramid, right? So in theory, you've gone through your pyramid, you've picked out your companies, you picked out your stocks, you have your little watch list going, and now you're going, okay, how do I put money into these? Like, how do I actually start, you know, putting stuff in the brokerage? So we need to talk about the concept of full or half positions, right? Um, and so the way to break this down is if your goal is to own 15 stocks, um, each should be an average of 6.66% of your portfolio, right? That's perfect devil's number. Mm -hmm. Stocks you feel more comfortable about or that are like more foundational to your pyramid, they can go above this threshold. So you can own more than 6.6%. So is that Apple, the devil's number? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's because... <laughs> It's not my fault, okay? It's because if you do 100 divided by 15, you get 6.6 because .6, it's six, six, yeah. and two, 6 and 2 thirds. Sorry. Simple maths. But there you go. Like maybe it'll, it's more memorable. 6, 6, mm. 6, 6.66. Okay. So say in the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> so stocks <laughs> that you feel more comfortable about or ones that are foundational, ones that are low risk can go above this threshold. So you could, I don't know, you could probably own up to 10% of a single company. But that's an awful lot of concentration. So just keep an eye on that. Um, and stocks that you feel less comfortable with or that are more high risk should fall kind of below this threshold. So it should be less than mm -hmm. 6%. Um, but this is something you can kind of change up as you go, right? So it's good to think about it in percentages rather than money because, you know, you're constantly growing your portfolio, you're, you're adding more money. So, you know, things are going to shift around. Um, but I would say sit down and make like percentage decisions up front and then check in as you go, because maybe a company that you had that was towards the top of your pyramid has stabilized as you've held it. And you're like, oh, do you know what? I feel comfortable enough that I'm going to add more to this position. That's totally cool. Just mm -hmm. make sure you're kind of checking in with yourself. However, once you have this percentage laid out, don't feel that you need to like build your full position like right off the bat. So if you're creating a portfolio as you go, like you don't have a lump sum to start with, you know, you don't have a hundred grand laying around. Um, it's obviously difficult to put a dollar amount on what a full position means to you. You know, is it a hundred dollars mm -hmm. an apple? Is it a thousand dollars an apple? Um, and so just kind of make sure to look at your portfolio from a percentage standpoint as you go. And I would say kind of start from the bottom of your pyramid and gradually build up. Um, I'll also mention when it comes to percentages, the longer that you invest, the more that you'll have stocks that grow, obviously, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're lucky, you may have a stock that grows astronomically. You know, you could have mm -hmm. a Shopify. Again, Netflix. fingers crossed. Yeah. Emmett's Netflix story. <laughs> 
crazy. And as that position grows, it's going to naturally become a larger and larger percentage of your portfolio. So you might not accidentally end up with a stock that becomes 15 or 20% of your portfolio because it has just outperformed everything mm. by such a substantial margin. In that case, again, check in with yourselves. I mean, we're fans here of, of letting your winners run. You know, don't jump out of a company just because it's suddenly become a huge part of your portfolio. But maybe be considering rebalancing your portfolio as you go. So that doesn't mean necessarily pulling money out of a company, but maybe putting more money into other companies that you also have a strong belief in that haven't seen that rapid growth yet. So that was just, you know, a bit of how you go about it. Now we have to talk about, we talked about percentages. We talked about how to allocate money. Now we have to talk about how to actually put the money in the stocks. And the most important lesson there is a thing called dollar cost averaging. This is something Emmett talks mm-hmm. about all the time. We cover a lot of these concepts on the Learn app, actually. That's important to say. Yeah. Um, if you like need a, you need any of this stuff reiterated, you want to check back in, uh, you want a bit more of a comprehensive education, definitely download the Learn app. Or you can actually use the Learn function in the My Wall Street app. So there you go. Um, free. There you go. Yeah. Um, so for dollar cost averaging, what that is, is you choose a few stocks and you're like, right, I'm going to buy a set amount in dollars. So you're going to say, I'm going to buy a hundred dollars of this stock every month or every quarter or whatever. And this is good because it kind of removes the emotion from the process as you purchase the same dollar amount every month, you know, you get in the habit, you kind of relax and you do this regardless of price. But the benefit for you is as you're building that initial position, it means that you get to take advantage of short term price fluctuations, which often means you end up with a cheaper average price per share. So I did an example of this, which I went back and looked at Viva Systems pricing. And I was like, okay, in September of 2021, let's say you had $1,200. And you were like, I'm going to put it all in Viva Systems. So if you put $1,200 into Viva Systems in September of 2021, you would have 3.8 shares of Viva Systems. Mm-hmm. But if you dollar cost averaged $100 a month into Viva Systems and you bought, the, and in this example, I said you bought every every month on the fifth of the month because I figured mm-hmm. you, know, you got your paycheck at the end of the month. It takes a couple of days. Um And in that case, the average cost per share would have been $237, which means that you would have ended up with five shares of Viva Systems. Mm, So basically, simply by buying consistently as the market goes through short-term fluctuations, you get to have extra shares for the same amount of money. That's great. So in my mind, that is the best way to build out your position as you're gradually, you know, building up your little portfolio month by month. And it, 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 it's also better to take your sum at the start of the month and not just put it all into one stock. Then you have money yeah. to do the same thing with a few others. And it, it, it yeah. does work out. Like as you know, we've, done, we've done a few examples like that, actually, in like our marketing campaigns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say kind of at the beginning, look at your foundation, pick out, you know, your three, four foundation stocks. And I'd say start building up those gradually. And mm-hmm. then, um, yeah, they kind of build your way up the pyramid and then maybe go back and pick up some more some more stocks. But there you go. That's kind of how you make your your first steps in building a portfolio. Yeah. There you go. You'd have a very good basis with that, like. Yeah. For sure. That's not bad. Yeah. It was actually, it was kind of a nice exercise. It was nice to kind of, like, uh, organize all that thinking on, on one place, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and we'll, we'll share all this information on our socials. So after the episode's yeah. um, released, check in with our Instagram, um, and we'll, like, you know, show you the pyramid and a bit more, um, te- like, a bit more text and copy along to go around it so you can see it visually because I know that's um always helpful yeah definitely perfect so then that wraps us up into our regular segment of girl boss of the week girl boss of the week so who is it this week Amory? okay I decided so I have been researching a company called Warner Brothers Discovery which is like the new streaming service provider mm-hmm. everyone's talking about and it's the merger between Discovery and Warner Brothers and now it's this big media behemoth and everyone is kind of like, ooh, what is this company going to look like? Because they have so much stuff. Mm. And anyway, they had to do an earnings call this week. And they, so they had this big slide show up. And they got butchered online for this one slide that they put up, which is they were comparing the how the audiences of the two streaming, the two separate streaming services right now that will eventually become on HBO Max and Discovery. Mm-hmm. They put them next to each other and they were like, oh, these are how they're unique and complementary to each other. And they described HBO Max as having a male skew and Discovery as having a female skew. Mm-hmm. And people online were really confused by this wording. They were like, what do you mean HBO Max is male skew? Like, it literally produced Sex in the City. Like, this, you know, people were... <laughs> and it's funny because the former CEO of Warner Media, uh, he left when the transaction went through and the companies merged. Uh, he, in March of 2022, actually said... 
um, that they had that HBO had been purposely broadening the storytelling and inviting more and more like female creators and writers to HBO because they were trying mm. to fix um, the audience imbalance that they had. And it used to be that HBO Max was only 42 audience was only 42 percent female. And within two years, they had got it to 49 percent female. Mm. So it's half like, yeah, yeah. So this male skew is because of the extra 1% of men that happen to have an HBO Max subscription. Um, so yeah, people were pretty pretty frustrated by this. They were kind of like, this ignores a lot of the new content that HBO in the last two to three years has purposely gone out of its way to go and find. You know, they're rebooting a number of like very female-centric shows. You know, like they rebooted mm -hmm. Pretty Little Liars and Gossip Girl and, and all these things. That, um, yeah. And so, yeah, I just thought, that's a funny little thing to have happen. The, 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 your first earnings call out the gate and you had this little snafu happen. So I thought little that failed. was funny. Yeah. That's not great. Like, and so um, that makes, maybe it's, you know what, maybe it was like intentional PR. Yeah. To get people talking maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Um, it's just, it's, it's very, even like in this kind of like environment, even to different, like, you know, differentiate yeah. between male and female. Like I, I can imagine people were like, well, what about non-binary people? Like, you know, Particularly why Particularly when like, it's only 1% yeah. of viewers. Yeah. Like 1%, that could be, like, it could literally be the difference of, oh, the male in the household is paying for the HBO Max subscription, but I the women are watching that. it way more. Yeah, I was just about yeah. to say that. Sure, like, it's not like that specific either. Like, hmm. And so mm. a lot of media people are just concerned that if they view OHBO Max as the male skew network, that they will, as they've already begun canceling um, a lot of TV shows and movies, people are just worried that it means that, um, yeah, that all this work that HBO has done in the last two years to invite in more female creatives will end, which is a real shame. So that makes our girl boss of the week, uh, the new Warner Brothers Discovery Company, and it, their, uh, their CEO, whose name is David Zalav. So... Maybe the person, maybe a junior marketing person who made that slide is being fired. Has been canned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, definitely. All okay. Right. So that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, tune back in in two weeks time. And if you want to follow us on socials, please do. You can find us on Instagram at Fun of My Life Podcast or on Twitter at My Wall Street HQ. And on TikTok at my Wall Street or on our new account dedicated to this podcast at Anne Marie and Nicole FML. And finally, if you're ready to start your investing journey and are looking for resources other than this phenomenal episode, check out My Wall Street's <laughs> Getting Started podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts or download the My Wall Street Learn app. Both are linked below. If you want access to our list of stocks, handpicked by our analysts and lots of other interesting finance and business content, download the My Wall Street app and create a free account today. That's all from us. We hope you enjoyed listening and see you next time.